church in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, may I greet the living church in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Um, thank you so much for that uh, season of worship, uh, praise and worship. Um, I don't think anybody does it better than you guys. Uh, it's beautiful to be a part of it um, and to just experience it and to immerse myself in it. So thank you so much to the praise team for leading us through that. Um, yeah, that was, that was beautiful. That was powerful. So like Kumfunsu Manyane, I am also a bit nervous today. Um, and that has nothing to do with you guys. It's not you, it's me. Um, it's just, yeah, <laughs> there's the issue. So while Mfudu Sumanyane can settle his nerves with singing, I can't sing to save my life. Um, so I'm just going to get into the text uh, and not uh, dilly dally, because I'm now in a key, and that's why I don't know the key, and better pan, and I'm missing a so we turn our Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 21. And today I want to talk about something that I think we all suffer from and experience uh, one way or the other. And that is the fear of rejection. Okay, the fear of rejection. We are all afraid of being rejected. And rejection hurts, right? Rejection hurts. Rejection finds us uh, from birth, right? It haunts us from birth. Uh, right up until we are, we are old. Even at our old age, uh, rejection does not grant us grace. It continues. That was not me. So even at our old age, rejection continues to pursue us. It continues to haunt us. Um, and so I want to talk about that because unless we are able, number one, to deal. Don't worry, this is not a therapy session. <laughs> Right, um, but also trigger alert. Some of you may get triggered uh, by the sermon uh, today. So unless we are able to deal um, not only with the fear of rejection, but unless we are able to deal with the pain and the brokenness that comes from being rejected, we will continue to hurt others. Because the rejected create more of their own kind. Um, so we go to the book of Genesis chapter 21, and if you are inclined to give the sermon a title, I will say the blessing of being unwanted. The blessing of being unwanted. So let's go to Genesis chapter 21. Stop hyping me, guys, because I'm going to buy the, I'm going to drink the Kool-Aid, I'm going to lose my thoughts, okay? So please, please just say amen if you feel like it, but yo, ah, I'm going to be in excitement. So, so please, man. So, yeah, let, let's go to Genesis chapter 21. Um, and allow me to, 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 yeah, allow me to pastor you today. Allow me to pastor you. Genesis chapter 21, it reads as follows. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set of time which God had spoken of. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh and all who hear will laugh with me. She also said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. So the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, scoffing. Therefore she said to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. Sure. But God said to Abraham, do not let this be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. That is not clear in the text. See, the text says Abraham was displeased because of his son, Ishmael. And then God goes beyond that and he says, no, that your displeasure, your sadness is not only limited to your son, but also your bondwoman. So whatever Sarah had said, 
Whatever, has, whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice, for in Isaac your seed shall be called. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman, because he is your seed. Now listen to this, verse 14. The first time Abraham rises up early, in the morning, took bread and a skin of water, and putting it on her shoulder, he gave it and the boy to, ha to Hagar and sent her away. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water in the skin was used up, and she placed the boy under one of the shrubs. Then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot. For she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite him and lifted her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, what is, or what ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. The Lord always adds a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. So the story begins, as we all know, with Sarah feeling unworthy, Sarah feeling um, not qualified enough to call herself Abraham's wife. You will remember uh, in the earlier chapters, I believe chapter 12, uh, she comes up with an idea that uh, Abraham should lie or sleep uh, with, with Hagar, who is her bondwoman, the servant woman. It's Sarah's idea, right? And this idea does not, is not something that is negotiated between Abraham and Sarah. It is Sarah out of her own insecurity because she could not bear Abraham a son, out of her own insecurity, comes up with a plan which she feels will qualify her or improve her standing in front of Abraham. Now here's the first problem and the major problem is that Sarah is trying to gain what she already has. She does not need the approval of Abraham. Abraham has already made her his wife. And so her not being able to have children does not disqualify her from being his wife. It is Sarah who disqualifies herself, right? Operating from a position of insecurity, she then begins to create chaos out of insecurity. Watch yourself when you act. Anything born out of insecurity will always produce chaos. We tend to speak, right? So, 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 so Sarah says, now lie with her and she will give you a son. Now that does not even make sense because she can't give him a son. And she mentions something important. She says, for the Lord has closed my womb. Now, there's a problem. When Sarah knows who's responsible for her barrenness, but then appoints Hagar to compensate for her barrenness, now my question is, Sarah, if it is God who has closed your womb, why must Hagar bear the burden of what God has done in your life? Why is it that you are not talking to God directly about what has happened in your life? And the problem with that, the problem and the challenge that we all experience is that we face hurt with God. Where's Manyan? We get hurt by God. We get disappointed by God, but we don't take the disappointment to God. Now, when you don't take the disappointment to God, you hurt us. We are not the ones who hurt you. It is God who has disappointed you. So don't take, don't make us bear the burden of your disappointment with God. I want to talk to Sarah here today, who's walking around bleeding all over everyone because of their insecurities. Right? Deal with your own insecurities, right? Deal with them, handle them, confront them, right? Because if you don't do it, you're going to hurt us and you're going to create chaos wherever you go. So she says, now, yeah, take her, let her have your, you know, it's so sad in this story, right? What's so sad in this story is that Hagar ends up being a victim of Sarah's insecurity. But Hagar's biggest problem is that the insecure one is the one with power. Yes. Right? <laughs> so, 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 so Sarah has the power but she does not have control over herself. Oh. So, so she has power, but she still has not been able to tame her insecurities. And that's Hagar's biggest challenge. It is that she is in the house of someone who is powerful, but does not feel adequate. Sure. Say go deeper, Papa.
Let me just say this. Let me. My appointment is here, so if what I'm about to say offends you, just know you'll have to go through the three of us. It's myself, Mente, and Bafana. So if you want to fight me, you have to go up against all two and a half of us. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, man, I'm trying to calm myself. <laughs> right. Now, now, let me say this, let me say this. It is dangerous for power and influence to be given to someone who is insecure, right? Uh, because they then use that power either to validate themselves, but that validation comes at the cost of someone's well-being. Okay, so go deeper, Papa. Right? It, is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is unfortunate and it is very dangerous for God to give us talents, Mvuzo, when we don't have control over our insecurities, right? Because the talent gives us influence, the talent gives us power. And woe unto those who fall under the, spend, the spell of our gifts when they are in the vicinity where we exercise these gifts, yet bleeding from our own insecurities. Say, go deeper, Papa. Let me say this. What happens is that because I preach and I speak, but my speaking and my preaching might not necessarily because, be because I'm gifted. It might be because I just want to be in the front because I'm tired of being invisible. It's operating from a position of insecurity. Then the church shouts amen every time I preach. A young lady gives me a smile or a, a look. And I believe, I believe it deep down that I am wanted by her. But remember, I've got power. I've got influence, right? And she has no way to escape my clutches. Because why? I am powerful and I've got influence. And when I end up in her, when I insert myself in her life, it is not to bring anything good. It is to make her bear the burden of my insecurity. There are many people in church that are broken. Many people in church who have been hurt, not by anything, but by powerful people who have failed to gain power and control over their own insecurities. Right. So we call them prolific. We say they're prolific because of the number of women they bed. We call them prolific. Little do we know that these are little boys who have been rejected and felt rejected by their fathers and their mothers. And because they, are, they never stop the bleeding, they go around cutting everyone. Their hearts here that have been shattered, not by a promise of a relationship. They are shattered because they dared to be in the vicinity of someone with power, but zero control over their insecurities. Right, so we always assume that Sarah is always a woman. Uh -uh. Sometimes Sarah takes the position. Sometimes Sarah takes the look. Sometimes, sometimes Sarah takes the disposition of your father. Right, the very man who was never around in your house. You felt rejected by him, so you go around looking for him everywhere. Now right, I've got news for you, right? I've got news for you. If it was God who allowed him to leave, it is not some guy from church who's going to bring him back. Nor will he return as a guy from church. Before, you not only... Yeah, so someone says to me outside, we're chatting, someone says to me, you know, when we as men are not in control of our insecurities, we hurt people. When women are not in control of their insecurities, they self-harm. Yeah. And so the church is full of people who are hurt by others and people who are hurting themselves. As a result, you need to gain control of this rejection that is haunting you, right? And I know you don't think it's there in your life. It's there. That's why you are the way you are. You need to gain control over it, right, of this rejection because it creates this insecurity that makes you behave in this self-destructive way. I had to tell Sarah today that it is this, your problem, was not caused by Hagar. This your problem, right? Oh, why am I talking like this? This your problem. <laughs> right? Your problem, right, was not caused by Hagar. So don't go around burdening Hagar with your issues. Yeah. Deal with your issues. <laughs> Deal with them. <laughs> Fix them. If you don't, they're going to collapse you. So many of us are so talented. 
gifted beyond measure. As I sit down and I listen to people speak and sing, say things that I'm like, how did this person even think of that? How did they hit that note? You know, how did they even I look at them? I think, man, the gift is so perfect. I hope the vessel. That I, I hope the vessel is okay. I, I pray the vessel is okay. Because, so, so, so I was talking uh, at, at, at Parklands the other time, and we were talking about spiritual gifts, right? Talking about spiritual gifts. And, and Paul says, you know, God gives gifts to everyone, right? Yeah. Hi, my friend. How are you, Ben? Sorry, I didn't recognize you, Ben. Young engineer of the year. <laughs> Yo, man, that's my friend, by the way. Because that's the way I do things. <laughs> Young artists, you know. Great guys, you know. Where was I? So we're talking about spiritual gifts, right? We're talking about, I'm aging. <laughs> yeah, I'm aging. I'm getting old fast. So we're talking about spiritual gifts. And, and Paul says, the spirit gives all gifts. Yeah. Right? He says it gives, the spirit gives gifts liberally. You know, prodigously, like wastefully. Gives generously to everyone. The spirit gives gifts to everyone. Just throws them around to everyone. Right? What the gift doesn't do is fix the vessel. Right? So, so the gift is given to a broken vessel. Right? But the gift never fills the cracks right, of what's broken. So what the vessel then needs to do is that when I'm in possession of this gift, then I need to be more conscious and aware of my brokenness. Because if I do not fix the brokenness, then I waste the gift. I hope you're listening to that, right? So then I waste the gift. So it, when I say, when I, when I, when I decide, when I, no man, you know what? I need to order my life. I need to be disciplined in my life. It is not for, it is not just for you. It is also for me, right? Because the gift that I have, right, must be protected by, it's, it's my burden to protect the gift that I have. Now, when you benefit from the gift, <laughs> It is a result of the work that I had to do behind closed doors, fighting, confronting myself with the gift. If that work does not do, does not happen in the closet, I'm not talking about practice, I'm not talking about preparation, I'm not talking about reading, I'm talking about sit. That's why Jesus, when Jesus says, Go, when you pray, find a closet. Yo, this is a That's why when Jesus says, Go, when you pray, find a closet, right? And he says, Find a closet. Do you know why we need to pray in a closet? Do you know why we need to pray in the closet? Because the moment we are given an audience to pray, we don't open our hearts, we start performing. So what the closet does, right? So what the closet does is that it eliminates the need for performance, right? So you go into the closet. What is happening in the closet, right? And by the way, I've heard people talk about prayer and whatever, discussions at church, and I listen to them, and all of them are following the same pattern. They are all concerned with appearance, performance. Should we wear? What should we wear? Should we cover our heads? Should we fall? Should we rule when we pray? What should we do when we pray? It's all performance. It's all outward. And I have a belief, I have a sneaky suspicion that the reason why we locate the discussion on prayer externally is because we don't want to take the trip internally because we know what we will find. We'll know what we will find once we go inside. So then Jesus says, you know what? To eliminate the possibility of performance, find a closet, go in there and confront yourself in prayer. Right? So prayer does not only change what you're going through doesn't only change what you're experiencing, but prayer is supposed to change you first before it changes everything that you're going through. And that is why then Jacob, when he's going home, right, and he sits at, at the brook and he fights and he wrestles with this man the whole night, the Bible then says, in the morning, Jacob, after wrestling the whole night, after praying, right, what's he worried about? Esau, after praying the whole night, he says, man, I won't let you go unless you bless me. Right, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless. The only prayer answered, the only response Jacob receives from the angel is not that Esau will not harm you. The first response is, you will no longer be called Jacob. You shall now be called Israel. And that's where the change happens. If you're a prayer warrior and all your wrestling does is change things externally, then you are wrestling with the wrong enemy. So the Bible then says, you see, angel walks away. I, Esau is still there, but Jacob has changed. Pray. Tell him your prayer again. Now, let's go back to my text, right? Because that's what Sarah, that's why you resemble Sarah so much. It's because you don't want to deal. Hard. 
So, Ishmael is born, grows up in the house. Now, I want you to see this, right? Before you have a problem with Sarah, I also take issue with Hagar. Okay? The Bible says, when she's pregnant, oh, right? she starts getting some airs about her, starts getting arrogant, right? And starts giving Sarah an attitude. Yo. <sighs> Digging English for this. So, so Hagar gets a child, yeah. right? which is something that Sarah doesn't have. Right. So Hagar is not happy with the gift. What, makes her, what gives her joy is that the lack of the gift on this side. Let me, let me. So, so, so Hagar hasn't immersed herself in the gift, oh, and I'll show you why. She hasn't immersed herself in the gift, right? What she does, right, is that she chooses to supplant herself from the gift and locate herself in Hagar's emptiness. So, so she glories. Oh, so for Hagar, the gift is meaningful for as long as Sarah doesn't have it. So then we've got two problems here. A young man by the name of Ishmael who's going to be born into the house of two women who are insecure. So then Sarah says, no, kick him out. Sarah says, so, so Sarah goes to Abraham, says, before he kicks, she gets kicked out, goes to Abraham, says, hey, this one is giving me attitude. Abraham says, like any South African man, it's not my kid, <laughs> not, my, not my business. You guys handle it together as women. Sounds very South African. Bit of Zimbabwean as well, eh? <laughs> See it there. You can sense it there. It's not my children. Not my kid. I'm not going to be involved. Right? But you were there in the process. Ah, it was a mistake. I didn't mean to. So she's your bond woman. And Abraham abdicates the seat of responsibility. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get to the end of my, this text that I read, I'm rushing to that, but I, I feel like I need to say this. Most of us are not suffering because life is bad. We're not suffering because life is tough. Okay? We're suffering because we were given to parents who are not ready to parent. Okay. Say go deeper, Papa. Yeah. Right? So we are not, we are not, we are not broken because we are cursed. Right? We are not broken because we are cursed. We are broken because we were given to people who they themselves were broken. By the way, they did not get us because they were, they wanted us or because they wanted to have us. They got us because they were looking for validation themselves. Right? And when we arrived, they realized that the validation was not going to come with us. Right? And that is why, that is why your mother never could talk to you properly. Whenever she spoke to you, she has nothing nice to say to you because you don't remind her of good things. Whenever she looks at you, she looks at the man who left her. She looks at you, she sees the man who disappointed her. When she looks at you, she does not see a gift. She sees the emptiness that gave rise to the gift. You are a reminder of the insecurity that gave that man a hook in her life and he broke her. And because she was broken, she remained behind breaking you. Oh, come on. We have, we have to talk about it at some point. You know? We have to chat about it at some point. It, it can't be that every time we're here in church, the church has to pay the school fees of your parents' failures. It can't be that every time we come to church, we have business. You know, there's something mad and crazy about this in my head. Something crazy about this, and I can't compute it. And I've been pastored for 14 years, right? Pastoring, senior pastor, churches. This thing, I could never get it out of my head. I could never understand it. How do adults spend six 
to eight hours on a Sunday in a so-called business meeting discussing issues that are never ending. Like, we're old, we can talk. Like, why is this thing not, why are we not finishing this thing? And, and I had discovered, man, no, man, we are sick. And because we're all sick, nobody gives us the platform to live out our sickness quite as well as the church. All right? So, so, so in order, so, I don't even want to use that phrase, man, because it's, 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 it's derogatory in some, in some instances, right? But, but, yeah, the, the ngul, right? It's not something that is confronted. It's not something that is dealt with. Instead, it is praised. We make people who are not well leaders. And do you know how we say it? We say, no, la, la, mfo, we beg and bin jale. No, he's not straight, he's sick. Right? So we praise him for being upfront and straightforward. He's not upfront, he's not straightforward. He's bleeding. That is why every time he stops talking, there are people, there are bo bodies everywhere. Now, and this man, right, has not been to the closet. This man has not been to a place where he appreciates the gift that he has been given. This man has not done the work, the internal work. That is why, that is why, when it comes to session in church, right, we don't pray in private. We don't pray in private. Do you know what we do? We canvas. What do you call this thing? Lobbying and what all, all of these things, right? The, the work we lobby externally. Right? Caucasus, externally, surround ourselves with noise. Do you know why we do that? Do you know why you need to surround yourself with praise singers? It is because when they are quiet, the insecurity scream. So you need them around you to keep screaming and shouting your praises, even when you are wrong. Why? Because the moment they keep quiet, they, so then we take you and we say, man, you are a man of, you can stand for the truth. We say, so you can come lead us, a whole organization. You can lead us. This guy, you can tell, he's got serious, serious mommy issues. Serious daddy issues. Whenever he stands up, he speaks vile, vile violence towards women. Because every time he looks around in the audience, a church full of women, he sees the mother who would not love him. And now you can't get rid of him because you've also given him power. I'm not talking about other people, I'm talking to you. So let me share this with you. So we go to, we go to session in 2018. It's a personal story, right? Go to session in 2018, we go to KZN. Uh, so go there and you know, it's a, it's a, I don't want to call it a beautiful session. Things are never beautiful. Yeah. Anyways, the session goes on and on and on. Yo, guys, I was humiliated at that session. Humiliated beyond, beyond, beyond. So anyways, and I called this one. Oh, man, the, you know, it's, <laughs> You need some sensitive friends around you, yeah. not, not, not these people. So I call him and like, hey, but, hey, guy, I'm from Session. Hey, 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 it was bad. And he says, I know, guy, don't tell me. I don't want to hear about it. And he hung up. Right? He's like, guy, don't tell me about it. I know. And he hung up. And when I drove home, hey, I was, I was hurt that day. I was hurt. So I say, nah. so I say you know what? I'm going to show them. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to show them that they don't know what they lost. Right. They've humiliated the wrong man. Right. So I'm going to show them. So I go to school and I register for a PhD. <laughs> yes. I, want, I, want you to, I want you to follow this closely, right? So I go to school and I register for a PhD. Right? Take, it, take it on, PhD. I don't even know what, what my interest is. Yes, I write a proposal. What I, want, I, don't, I just put English together. Hey, it sounds good. It's going through, right? And now I'm stuck with this thing. It's a proposal. It looks flashy, but I have no interest in it. I'm not connected to it. Do you know why? Because my pursuit of the PhD was never for knowledge. It was always to silence the feeling of inadequacy, having been rejected by a church session. Now, instead of dealing with the wound, I looked for an external thing to validate. <laughs> PhD. But it's moving, dog. And we miss it, right? We miss it. 
especially because when we feel rejected, we never sit down and say, why does it hurt? What's hurting me about this? Right? And I'll tell you because sometimes rejection speaks to your insecurities. Right? People reject you and that rejection becomes a spotlight on your own insecurities. And instead of dealing with that, turn the spotlight onto something else so that you can cover. That's why black men, whenever they have money, you see it. Okay. Let me say this again. Don't say that, ladies. I'm coming for you. I'm going to snatch those wigs. So. Right, please, allow me to. Guys, let me say this, because I'm going to say So, that's why when black men get money, yeah? Ladies, black ladies, black women think black men are performing for them, right? When they get money, it's this whole performance. You go like, you see it, you see it, you see it, most. You know what I'm talking about? You see it. Whenever black men, they're not performing for you, they're performing for their fathers. Now, their fathers are not the guys that raise them. Their fathers are white men. <laughs> see, see, a black man idolizes a white man so much. That whenever he gets money, he wants to outdo the white man. He's got no interest in everyone else. He's trying to get the attention of a white man. <sighs> that is why Steve Biko says a, a black man is a man not. <sighs> Ask any black man, who are you? He doesn't know who he is. Ask him, who are you? He'll tell you what he does, not who he is. Black man doesn't know who he is. He doesn't know what he stands for. He can tell you what he does. And what he does is exactly what a white man does. I'm a provider. I'm a pro a protector man from what? With what? Yo, you, can't even, yo, you can't even protect yourself from the reputation of being an abuser. See, this is what a protector does. This is what, this is, see, for you to be a protector, you need money. Yo. Proper wealth. Let me, but let, let, me, let me say this. Whenever we talk about GPV in South Africa, whose face comes up? A black face, right? Have you guys forgotten about Oscar Pistorius? Have you guys forgotten about Nino? Who, this guy who raped a kid at a restaurant. The white guy, right? But here, here's white, what power does, is that it grants you anonymity when it comes to shameful acts. Something that black men don't have. Hey, yeah, this thing is lang Point is, black men desires to be validated by a white man. And when the white man does not validate him, woe unto you, black woman. We say this jokingly all the time. Mlungwam. Internalized. Self hatred. Internalized. Over glamorizing of the white man. So, black boys, I'm calling black men, black boys are performing for their white fathers. That's why we are the loudest wherever we go. Because we are children who have been neglected always screaming and craving attention. Yo. I don't even know how I got here. So then, so then, so then, Sarah Hagar leaves. Do you remember? Hagar leaves. Right. She runs away. And then the angel of God finds her. She's pregnant. She runs away with the child. Pregnant. I can't, go into, I can't even go into details about this, just how irresponsible this is. Right? So she leaves, the angel finds her. Yo, this, this is beautiful. And then 
the angel says to her, go back to Sarah's house, right? And God will bless you. Uh, so, but, but go back to Sarah's house. Then the angel doesn't go talk to Sarah to say, stop mistreating Hagar. <sighs> I hope somebody's catching that, right? So, so, so Sarah hasn't changed, right? And it's power, the breakthrough comes for, Sarah, for, her, for Hagar. And she says, the God who sees, right? So for the first time, Hagar is not a vessel for exploitation. For the first time, Hagar is identified by God as a vessel carrying blessings. So when God talks to Hagar in the wilderness of Beersheba, right? And he says to her, I will bless you. Hagar feels seen. Nothing has changed, but Hagar has changed. So when she goes back and Sarah mistreats her, so when Sarah mistreats Hagar, it does nothing to Hagar because Hagar has changed. So Sarah's mistreatment gets seen for what it is, Sarah's insecurity. Ah, so the more she pours, the more, the more violence she pours out towards Hagar, the more Hagar holds on to the promise that what I'm carrying is a blessing. Now, 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 what, what, what did Hagar need to do? You know, I would call her Hagar. What did Hagar need to do, right? She needed to move from the externals, move internally to find and locate the truth of the matter. And that is, I am even without her. I am valuable even without her validation. Hagar overtook Sarah, even though Sarah had all the resources. And this is how Hagar overtakes her. This is how Hagar overtakes her. She finds and she roots her worth in what God says about her, not in what Sarah says about her. Oh. Yes. Hey. The Bible says she goes back, continues to live there for 13 years with this young boy, and the boy grows. And the boy grows, and the boy grows, right? And then eventually Isaac is born. There's a parallel here I was going to share with these guys earlier on. Now let me just throw it in there, and then just so that you can see I, 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 I read this text. <laughs> but let me just throw it in there. So there's a beautiful parallel here. Now we're talking about the blessing of the unwanted. Is that this, un, this unwanted blessing? Unwanted, but a blessing. You see, Ishmael is not a problem. <sighs> Ishmael didn't do anything wrong. Are you here, Ishmael? Ishmael is not a problem. Ishmael didn't do anything wrong. But Ishmael cannot grow up in Sarah's house. Because if he remains in Sarah's house, he will never be the blessing he was declared to be. <sighs> See, if, 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 if Ishmael continues to grow in Sarah's house, Sarah is going to continue bleeding all over him until Ishmael internalizes what Sarah thinks of him. So, in order for Ishmael to expand, in order for Ishmael to grow, in order for Ishmael to rise, he needs to be taken out of Sarah's house. Because if he remains in Sarah's house, Sarah will make sure that he never becomes what God wants him to be. Amen. Sometimes rejection is a blessing because it removes you from people who are going to be a hindrance to your progress. It hurts when they leave. It's painful when they don't show up. Sometimes I wonder, I wonder, I wonder sometimes, I wonder, how would I have turned out if I grew up in the same house with my father? How would I have turned out as, as much of a man who was, who was given to his liquor? How would I have turned out if I watched him every day beating my mother? How would I have turned out? It hurt when he left. It hurt when he wouldn't show up at school place. It hurts. But some blessings cannot be watered by ill discipline. Blessings cannot be watered by people's insecurities. And so the detachment is painful. The detachment, the removal is hard. It hurts. It's... So Sarah says, not happy with him. Listen to this, guys. He's a 13-year-old boy. 13. He's a kid, Sarah, with all the power, all the resources, doesn't do the work. She looks at this boy and she sees him as a threat. 13 year old. Oh man, I've worked with Sarahs in my life. Old men with social capital in the church. 
The moment you stand up and you start getting invited, man, all of a sudden you're a problem. They don't hate you for what you're saying. They hate you because you highlight their insecurities. Your giftedness is a problem because your giftedness takes the spotlight that they so crave. Nani man can you go sbiza? Mr. Banis and Abantu. So from time to time, <laughs> the blessing, right, must be removed from the presence of the insecure. Sometimes the blessing must be removed from the pleasant from the presence of the bleeding takes it. I love what God does. He says, take him to the wilderness. <sighs> you catch that? He says, take him to the wilderness. Right? Yeah. Don't raise him in the house. Hey, can I talk to someone who's addicted to their comfort zone? <laughs> right? says, you heard Jim Gower say, nothing ever grows there. You need to leave the comfort zone because nothing ever grows in there. And he takes him to the wilderness. Oh, and I love this. right? And I love this. So that when Ishmael rises. Abraham can't claim his fame. So that when Ishmael rises, Sarah can't take credit for his growth. So God takes him to the middle of nothing. Emptiness. so that he can give him everything. Can I say this? Sometimes God can't bless you where you are. It's too much clutter. It's too much noise. It needs to take you out. Place you in the middle of nothing. With nothing. Right? So that he can give you See, there's a beautiful thing about nothingness. Nothingness is emptiness. And God is in the business of populating empty spaces. See, he can't populate what is already populated. It's gone. It's in the wilderness. I said, can you imagine at some point? I'm going to sit down now. I right? don't want to make you guys cry. So I can imagine at some point, Ishmael, he was a boy, 13 years, saw his father, right? He saw his father. Right? And when he left, his father gave them bread and water. You're going to raise no child with bread and water. So allow me to say that Abraham gave them enough to get away from where he was but not enough to survive where they were going. And I thank God that Abraham abdicated that duty because what Abraham neglected, God adopted. Yeah. And God takes over Ishmael's life. So when Ishmael grows and is blessed, he's not blessed by his father. So there I was, just come back from school. Helderberg, and my father calls me. He calls me. He says, hey, uh, how are you? I didn't even know where he got my number from. He says, how are you? And I said, no, I'm good, man. He said, fine, how are you? He said, there's one thing that my mother did for me. It's to not allow me to be bitter towards my father. Yeah. That's a blessing she gave me. Right? She never allowed that. She never allowed me to go through that. So then he calls. He's like, hey, how are you? Blah, blah, blah. He says, hey, do you have 200 rands for me? Yeah. Right? I said, Okay. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, how should I send you? Says, can you bring it? I'm like, no. Too far. Can't bring it. So can I e-wallet it or whatever? It's like, hey, Dwana, it's going to be hard to get it. Right. So I drove to where he was to deliver the 200 bucks. Right. So I gave it to him. Right. I said, here it is. And he looks at me and he says, hey, ukulele, man. And he's shocked, right? And he says, Ukulele, man. Thank you. He takes the man. He says, hey, Ukulele, man. 
And I, I look at this guy and I can see myself on his face. The splitting image. I see myself on his face. And I look at this guy. Says, I had to grow up without a sense of belonging. You know, I don't know. I don't think you understand this. You know how hard it is to grow up without faces that look like yours? Right? It's, that thing dislocates you. Right? And, and there he was in front of me with my face. Right? I gave him the 200 bucks. I went back into my pocket. I took out another 200 bucks. I, I gave it to him, my, my dad. And he says, that incident, I'm, I'm sitting down now. Yeah? That incident became a catalyst for what was to be a period of reconciliation between him and my, I mean, between him and I. So when he gets sick, the last three months of his life, he didn't know who to call. So he called me. Because he knew that every time he calls, I'll be there. So I went, took him to hospital. My friend treated him. And it was at that moment when we were driving together every day for three months to the hospital, we have this conversation. So I asked him, so what happened? That was my question, like, what happened? You know, what, 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 what happened? And he says, hey, you know, I didn't know how to be a father. So he came from a strict home. When they had me, my mother and him, outside of wedlock, he was ostracized by his family. I need you to follow this, right? So when they had me, he was ostracized by his family. Right? They belonged to this other very strict church, stricter than ours. When it, <laughs> when it, when it comes to such issues, right? So they ostracized him. Right? So for him, for him, I was never a blessing. I was the beginning of his troubles. Right? So when he shared that with me, and he told me this, and I looked at this guy that I've been angry with for so long. I looked at him, and I saw what I could become if I don't heal from what he did to me. Because I bear his image, chances are I bear his propensities. And if I don't do the work the work he didn't do, yeah. I'm going to do to my children what he did to me. <laughs> I, I, I buried my own father. I preached at his, at his funeral. I preached because I was a pastor. I can tell you this for now, for free, of charge. Don't need to pay me for this one. If I grow up in a house with him, I would not have become a pastor who could bury him. Are you guys catching this? So, it starts off looking like rejection. We move into a wilderness and it feels like neglect. We grow and rise in the wilderness and we start feeling like it's hardship until we have to return to Abraham's house because Abraham now needs what we have. <sighs> the blessing of being unwanted is not that you thrive where you have been thrown. The blessing of being unwanted is that you return to become a blessing to those who did not want you. Right? That's the biggest, biggest blessing you could ever become, right? Because, let me tell you this, because if you don't go back, you remain what they are, hurt and insecure. It is when you go back as a blessing that you're healing. Ah, man. trim 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 trim. Let me close this off. Let's pray. So we're going to, we, we were at Togi last week, Theater of Grace, um, just at the lakes. 
So we get a question. We're talking about forgiveness in the afternoon. We get a question. Man. Let's get a question. And the question is, how do I forgive my father or my mother? How do I forgive my mother? Like, who um, lied to me? Man. And now she's dead. So how do I forgive my mother? She lied to me. And now she's dead. And how do I, how do, I do that? How do I? Who? I read that question. It's between two ladies who are clinical psychologists. Right? And Mom Lulu says something profound. I'm going to give it to you free of charge. Even though you were not there. She says something beautiful, profound. She says, you know what? In order for her to forgive her mother, she needs to re-image her dead mother. Right? You need to bring her up. Right? You need to humanize her. Right? You need to humanize her. You need to put yourself in her shoes. What does it take for a woman who carried a child for nine months to give birth to that child and then abandon that child? What do you think happened? Like, what do you think happened? What do you think happened to your mother? Is it possible that when she had you, raising you would have placed your life in danger? So she gave you away because she felt you'd be safer away from her. What, 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 if, what if having you was the beginning of her spiraling, right? And so she had to give you away because she couldn't bear the thought of you being in her care. What if, what if the decision wasn't as easy as you think it was? What if your dad wasn't a deadbeat? What if he loved you? What if, what if he loved you unconditionally? What if he, he dreamt big things for you and the dreams he had for you did not match what was in his hands? Just remember your father grows up in a society that will not recognize him as a man unless he's got something. What if he didn't reject you? What if he didn't leave you? What if you're a victim of his brokenness? Do you still feel justified in your anger? This guy walking down the road, and he hears someone hit him on his ankles. Hard with a stick. He's ready to fight. Turns around. He's ready to fight this guy. He looks at this guy. It's a blind man with a cane. He's ready to fight him because of what he feels in his ankles. He's ready to fight because of the pain. He's ready to beat him up. And he turns around. It's not someone he can fight. It's someone with an infirmity. And when he spots the infirmity, compassion overcomes him. What if you viewed the people who hurt you as being infirmed? Don't you think that compassion would replace the anger? And once the compassion takes root, you'll grow. I'll, I'll tell you this, and I'll pray with you. I'll tell you this, I'll tell you this. Until you deal with the pain, you will never experience the blessing you are meant to be. Until you deal with that pain. I know you're here, man. I know. Father neglected you. And today, you're doing the exact same thing he did to you. Abandoned your children. They're, rise, they're growing up without you. You know it. You, see, you know it, man. Don't make me repeat this thing over and over again. I want to pray with someone here tonight. I don't know, someone who says, or this afternoon, someone who says, Lord, I'm Sarah, failing to heal, and I'm bleeding over everyone. I'm failing to see just how privileged I am because I'm blinded by my own insecurities. Failing to see the power that is in my hands, and I'm misusing it and wielding it to harm others. I'm Sarah. I'm Sarah today.
Right? Someone says, I'm Hagar. Tired. Tired of glory in other people's deficiencies. Yes, just relocate me from their deficiencies and place me in my own blessedness. Someone right? says, Today I'm, I'm Hagar, Lord. I'm right here. Can you see me? Can you see me? Can you see me? Can you see me? I'm going to talk to Ishmael. The Bible says, and the boy grew as a wild man, untamed, free to roam the wilderness, not in Sarah's house, who would tell him, don't jump on those couches. Don't touch those plates. Don't eat from that. <laughs> he grew in the wilderness. The Bible says he was a wild man, untamable. I want to talk to Ishmael today, who instead of running wild, exploring, expanding, growing and becoming a blessing that they should be, they still hung over what they did to him in Sarah's house. I want to talk to Ishmael today as I pray with you. Please stand. enough and let's do this let's do this let's let's pray with someone whose womb has been closed by God someone feeling rejected by God someone feeling ignored by God someone feeling neglected by God you started that business a number of times and each time you start it falls it falters there's nothing that grows around you nothing when you touch it it dies and someone who says that's me my womb is barren I'm talking literally and figuratively. Someone who says, I can't bear children. I can't, I can't. I, my womb is barren. Have you closed it for me? Someone who needs that deliverance. I want to ask you to do something brave and not do it for me, do it for yourself. Just to come to the front as we confront God about this. Say, Lord, started a family. It fell apart. Got into another relationship. It broke down. Everything I touch dies. It's barren. That's your prayer. Come to the front. Let's pray together. Right? Someone who says, Lord, deliver me. Lord, hear me. Right? Lord, hear me. Right? Lord, see me. If indeed you are a God who sees, if indeed you are a God who hears, if indeed you are a God who can, won't you do it for me? Won't you do it for me? Why don't you do it for me? I'm going to pray with someone who finds themselves in the wilderness, surrounded by nothing, thinking that they're being abandoned. I'm going to pray with someone. Are you in the wilderness right now? Are you in the desert? There's nothing around you. Do you think God has abandoned you? And someone who says, Lord, just help me to hold on, just to hang on a little bit longer until you populate the empty spaces, until you populate the wilderness that I'm in. Come to the front. Your healing is here. Your deliverance is here. Someone says, Lord. Change it for me. Change it for me. Disappointment is with God. Don't let other people carry it. Your disappointment and your anger is with God. Don't let other people carry it. Bring it to God. Bring it to the Lord. Bring it to the Lord. Bring it to the Lord. See a tandas. Stop in trouble with you. Go see a two at the guy or Sekaya is Zuluin. Tiko ongum dali was a zonkis into his pans quella. So nini nanini chow and a call. Belundini le sabata. Dembele, 
Yesita kwa sika chuta nyate machobosa Wena tiko kungeka biko ndaba na zinduli Wena tiko wabali kaya kuti Wizi sukulwa na ngezi sukulwa Silapa tiko singaba nduwa na bako Akukondo si itembi leyo tiko Ngapanje kwe kamalako Tiko nguwa si itembi sileyo Oko puna kukusenza zongi zinto Wasi sugela si te Si sabu mnyame ni wasbize la kuwe tiko Aga kwa mnyumdu wa smazi yonga pandre kwako Kungo ogo tiko si bene la kuwe O si aza basine danga anto Ama kwele no salpoli la basine danga anto Uwe kupela tiko si azi yo Ogo pangente toyo mlomo wako Wasa neki spaka paka Kente toyo mlomo wako Wasi zinzi silwa anji Siti chochufa yes Siti chochufa nyana katiko Boba kunge kazi lako Apo si sanjwa kona Singama niki niki Sinyuku nyuku si sono Kodu wa tiko noka kunjalo wenu standile Na babandu anabako tiko Basi chule no chako Basi ngamile basi penga Basi vezi misan basa pamgu wako Bati tiko nguo na manja onge Okulungi subo mibabo Ubo mibetu glenda utiko bunjenge ngube niki niki Singama zafu Sisi ntekisa na kubandwa banga zani nawe Mithale sienzini ya kwe kutandaza Kodu ubo mibetu kupeke sa chawe Nganda nganda chiko Ngenelela genelela nge sanja sako Asizo utinu wa kukteta nawe Nobing hatu wena ufa Kodu wa sizo utinu Besi teli le glonya kupeli leyo Sisa tela na glonyaka Ise ilandwinye kutala si tandazel Asizo kuyeka Koba tasi nga yega wena si nga yapi Unama tesha tiko Usitike Singa funi na uteta nawe Singa bako Sinya mezele sitarunguwe Sinama kresha tiko, siku tuke, sikale kise, singa bako Sizi nchafini zako tiko, singa boni bako, singa baka kateki bako Sitalo nguwe, naglenda usizbona siku yo asenza ngato Goro tiko siya yasi, okokba wena, ungu tiko bonayo Spugnya mezela Sipumo nje tiko Abandu anabako bawa Befuka Kuba beba mbelele tembe no kokba Ngenyi minu tiko za svelela Wena wambonu wakare Emelele kelele kumtu anake Nati tiko sibone Sibone pansi kwa loma cholo Esinga bona kali siku wa sibone Ube nengeba Ube netaho nga kuti Kasi si muka kulenda wo Masi ambe kukwi nguku ezi mpilo nzetu Sibu yele kwa zi ameko Zi suku meza yo Kodu wa singa bandu bambi Aba kukukleyo Sisi gelelu smualisi Satla sako se ngeba siwe pesu kwetu Kulo utiko Una kusikina singa puna kubeka Asmi sepa mgo trone ya kesinge na bala Kulo tiku ngena stunzi sa jika na buyambo Emulonye nwaka kufunye na wanga buko etana nko hiso Kulo tiku ngena koka Ili zwila keli mengo na pagate Kamen lati Maibe lutu mweno zugone mbeko kuse kuwa mapagate Amen So, rejection slips as deep as you have rejected yourself. It slips as hard 
as it confirms your rejections of your very self, your own insecurities. Thank you, Pastor uh, Stu, for that sobering and healing message. Um, thank you, Pastor Mente, for the prayer. Thank you for, for, for wrestling with God on our behalf, because we, we do have a, a problem sometimes as Christians. Instead, when, when, when we see Jacob wrestle with God on his corner, instead of picking our own corners to wrestle with our own God, we wrestle with Jacob's wrestling with God. Um, but we're going to break for, for, for lunch now. But before we do that, I'll invite Harmonium to give us one item. And as they're coming up front, I just want us to take note of what's coming after lunch. The afternoon program is starting at 3 o'clock sharp. And this is what you should expect. So at 3 o'clock, we're going to have a presentation from Jabulile. Uh, she's from the IEC. She will be speaking to the issues also related to the student cluster. After that, we will engage that uh, in the same format we did in the morning. Um, and then we're going to have some inputs from the um, Stasa TOC structure. And then we're going to get a good dose of uh, praise and worship as well. And then the voice you had in the prayer we just received it's going to give us um, a powerful message later on. So you don't want to miss this for, for anything. They will sing, and then I will pray, and then we break for lunch.
Can we all rise as we pray? Modimo rara, modimo buitse por ya kolebo. Re kolebo kela chono refilling yone le sabata se simonati so refilling lone. Kika mo khora rara retla mo khwe na rerenga tsharo ya gago le ratola gago kabelano ya gago mo buitse po. Dine le rona go tloga jano go fitlhela re boa gape mo motshegareng wa go mbieno. Re tshwarele dibetsa rona ka Jesu re rapela. Amen. I'll see you guys at three o'clock. Enjoy your lunch. A trouble sometimes. I hear you feeling man's heart with it. Freedom will.